there despite the small numbers. So we, you know, patients are still not rocking up to the hospital. Yeah, no, I can, we, we have a same similar issue. Patients are terrified to come to the hospital for their procedures, but also, you know, it's a, there's a lot of organization we're trying to do to try and, um, you know, get testing within 48 hours of the procedure and so on. So it's, that's also been quite a bit of a challenge um, to do. So we'll see. Um, so I think, Farrell, because, you know, you didn't mention you had a really long presentation, I think we should start. Um, and, you know, I'm sure people, more people will join as we move along. So um, it's my pleasure. Thank you, everybody, for joining our CAT conference again this morning. Uh, it's my pleasure to have Farrell Halig. Um, we really do have had a very international faculty, um, Farrell. So you're the first person from Africa uh, and from South Africa, which is uh, my home and where I was born. And so we're really delighted to have you. Um, for those of you who don't know Farrell, uh, he's the cath lab director at Sunning Hill Hospital in Johannesburg. Uh, and he's probably, you know, one of the top CTO operators and complex PCI operators that I know of around the world. Um, and certainly in South Africa, he's a point of, of reference for all the institutions uh, who have complex PCI or, CTO or CTOs. So we're all really excited to you to hear what you're going to share with us, Farrell. Uh, it's all yours. As I mentioned, Ahmed will manage and moderate this with me and handle all the questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you very much, Azim. It's indeed a pleasure and an honor to, to present to you. And I'm going to try and give you a sense of how to approach CTO um, from basics to, to some advanced uh, elements, but not the super advanced which I think we'll reserve for another day, perhaps. Um, just to mention that CTO is present in about 15 to 20% of cath lab coronary cases, which means for every thousand angiograms, you'll have close to 200 CTOs. So it's a significant number. And by definition, it's a total occlusion of more than three months, which means it's a stable coronary lesion. And we know from multiple trials, including ischemia, that PCI and chronic stable disease does not improve survival. So therefore, CTO-PCI is for symptom relief and quality of life improvement. Because we don't improve survival, therefore, PCI must not create mortality, which is very important. So CTO-PCI needs to be safe and successful. And in order for that to be the case, we need to make the right decisions at the right time. So I'm going to talk about how we plan for a CTO case. There have been two consensus uh, publications in the last year, one in your intervention and one in circulation. Um, and these have dealt with the methodology of CTO. And I want to focus on methodology rather than data. In South Africa, we have these five animals, the big five, which are the most dangerous animals to encounter on foot. And uh, it's something that's a theme if any of you have been on safari. So, I'm going to tell you what the big five questions are for CTO that you need to ask yourself before starting a case. The first question is, do I know where to start? Is the proximal cap clear or is it ambiguous? Do I know where to go? Is the vessel course clear or ambiguous? Do I know where I'm going to end up? Is the distal cap clear or ambiguous? And how long is the journey? Is the occlusion long or short? We call anything above 20 millimeters long, but of course that's a relative number. And do I know what route to take? Am I gonna go luminal, subintimal, ADR, RDR, and am I prepared for unexpected opticals to, and to change course? So these are the five things you have to clarify before you start a case. And in order to clarify these questions, you have to do a proper angiogram. So dual angiography is the basis of answering those questions. So we do this under low magnification, no panning, so you can not have movement interfering with what you're seeing. Look carefully. Have I seen the proximal cap, the distal cap, the vessel course, and all collateral channels? And be prepared for unusual projections. Look at this example. This is a... And you can see this right injection demonstrates filling of the distal LAD. 
So we can only see the distal third of the LED filling. However, if you look at it, you'll see this conus branch, very proximal conus branch, gives off the epicondylar collateral to the proximal LED. And if your catheter is deep and you miss this branch, you will not see that. So if you look at a injection through a micro catheter into that collateral branch and due to an injection, you can see that in fact this is a very short occlusion. And that whole proximal segment of the LED would have been missed without appropriate projections. Then we look at the, so we look at the proximal cap, we look at the distal cap, we look on the right here at all the interventional collaterals, and we look at the vessel course, and sometimes we cannot see the vessel course, so we in this case, this is the presumed vessel course. So how can we plan from this information in this particular case? Well, what is clear is the proximal cap, there you see it, the distal cap, there you see it, the landing zone, which I'll talk more about, which is this area, if you're going to do intersection re-entry, for distal landing zone and a proximal landing zone. And we've seen the collateral channels. But what is ambiguous is the vessel course here. Is it A, which most likely it is, or is it B, which it may sometimes be? And if you're going to start with rigid wires and it happens to be B, that is where you're going to create life-threatening complications. So the point I'm making about with this example is that if there is any ambiguity of any element, that ambiguity needs to be resolved before you can proceed safely with the case. So can this case be done by integrate Y escalation? Well, it's got a favorable proximal cap and a large clear distal target, but the lesion is long and the vessel course is uncertain. So the answer is unlikely. The proximal cap, let's talk more about this. We, are, we determine if it's ambiguous or clear. Is it blunt or tapered? Is there a side branch at the occlusion? And can you get to the proximal cap? Is it accessible? So here's some examples. Here's a clear tapered cap with no branch, which is accessible. Here's a blunt cap with a branch at the, at the cap, but you you can get there, and it is clear where the cap is, although it's unfavorable with the branch. Here's a cap with multiple bridging collaterals with a large side branch. It is accessible, but it's rather ambiguous where you need to aim for. And it's blunt, very chronic. This is another ambiguous blunt cap with two side branches at the cap. It's got a lot of disease and possible segment, which may make access a little difficult, and it's ambiguous. This is a highly ambiguous cap with multiple branches and no clear way to aim at all. And this is an ambiguous cap which is inaccessible. Here you can see the proximal vessel with multiple very tight lesions and an ambiguous proximal cap indicated by the red arrow. So we need to look carefully at these different caps and assess their characteristics. So if there is proximal cap ambiguity, how do we resolve it? We've got three basic methods, IVUS, retrograde wiring, or getting subintimal. So when you get subintimal, you can do that anti-grade proximal to the cap and dissect past the cap. So even if you can can't see it, you can pass it in the subintimal space, or you can get retrograde and dissect up to the proximal cap, which will demonstrate where the cap is situated. So this is an IVUS example. What you can see in the yellow arrow is the proximal cap. The orange arrow indicates the IVUS catheter and the red arrow, the wire. If you look at these cross sections, you can see the IVUS catheter in the small side branch and you can see the wire entering the correct branch. So this is how you can navigate in the, when you're uncertain as to where the cap is. The alternative method is retrograde wiring. If you look at this example, there's the left main Stent into the circumflex, and here you can see two branches. There's a brain graft onto a low OM, and a second brain graft onto a higher OM. And this was a totally occluded graft where the anastomosis had been made graft and graft because of aortic disease, and this has had a previous intervention and was totally occluded. We opened this totally occluded stent in order to get access to this upper OM branch. And if you look 
carefully over here, you can see we're able to wire backwards. And then if you look at the live images, even through a stent where there's no clarity whatsoever where the cap is, retrograde wiring enables you to access the proximal cap in the token. I guess another method of resolving the Farrell? proximal cap. Yes. I'm uh, sorry, you're breaking up quite a lot. Am I? Let's do this. Um, I, um, I reconnect or can you hear me now? I just the audio quality intermittently gets poor and you break up quite a lot. And I just wanted to make sure um, I've checked with some of the other participants and I'm the, the only one who's struggling. Oh, all right, well, I can try and move to another location. Um, yeah, either that or I wonder if it's not worthwhile, um, you know, disconnecting and reconnecting a second and we start again and we just carry on from here just because these are so great. I just feel bad that you, we can't hear you as well. Okay, let me do that. <clears throat> Absolutely, the voice uh, problem. We are unable to get the complete information. There is off and okay. on voice. Thank you. We'll try and see if we can get that any better. I'm trying to leave the meeting, but I can't see how to do it because I'm a host. So if I, I don't want to end the meeting. Um, um, I think if you're a co-host, well, we, we, what we can do is um, Millie, can you take off Dr. Halleck as, as, uh, as our host? Uh, the one other thing that's a good suggestion here, um, well, there are two suggestions really. The one is to try and turn off your video because then maybe you'll save bandwidth and we'll just hear your voice and we could try that. If that doesn't work, uh, I, don't, you know, I don't know if you have a local, I can find you a local number in Johannesburg for, um, for Zoom to call into and maybe talk over the phone. But should we try turning your video off? I'll do that. Yeah, and maybe let's you know share your slides again. Let's try without the video. Uh, I can still see your video though. Can I do that now? Okay. Uh, yeah, let's maybe go one slide back and and try that again. Uh, if that doesn't work, in the meantime, Millie will find a, a phone number for you just in case. Okay, do you hear me? Yeah, we hear you, fine. Okay, so um, here's another method to resolve the proximal cap is to get subintimal proximal uh, to the occlusion. And you can see in this graphic, and this is an example of doing just that. Here's a catheter in the right coronary and you can see an ambiguous cap with a wire in a side branch. And then in the moving picture, you can see the wires entered the subintimal space just proximal to the cap and knuckle wires advanced uh, into the subintimal space beyond the cap to resolve the ambiguity. And then yeah. resolving the proximal cap ambiguity is getting retrograde and getting subintimal. And then coming in the subintimal space retrograde you can now see in this LAD where it was not clear where to aim, quite clearly where you need to aim your anti-grade wire. So this is the, these are the methodologies for resolving the proximal cap. Azim, if you can just confirm you can hear me okay now. It's so much better now. I'm sorry, I didn't stop you earlier actually to do this. It's much better, thank you. Good. Um, so how do you create a dissection like this that we've just been talking about? So. You need to get a microcatheter up to the occlusion. This is a retrograde example. Use a penetrative wire and with a microcatheter to penetrate the cap and then follow with the microcatheter into the plaque. Then you take a polymer jacket wire in a knuckle formation and advance that. And that will usually find a plane of cleavage in the subintimal space, like uh, dissecting fat off meat. You find this plane of cleavage and will uh, continue into the subintimal space and you then advance the microcatheter to follow. Now, once you've got a knuckle wire in the subintimal space, it is unusual to have 
uh, vessel disruption or rupture, and it is much safer than advancing at the tip of the wire. Let's talk now about the distal cap. So the, we need to determine if this is ambiguous or unambiguous. And you can see here in, the, in this image, a clear distal cap with a landing zone. But in the image on the right, uh, the vessel course and the distal cap is completely ambiguous in addition to the proximal cap. You can see, is this the true vessel with a proximal cap? Is this the, pro, uh, is this the distal cap? Is this the distal cap? which is the right vessel, which is the right branch. It's a really highly ambiguous distal cap. And the distal cap, we also look at the size of the target. So if you've got a large distal target to aim for, it's really analogous to throwing a dart and having to hit anywhere on the dartboard to get recanalization. But if you've got a tiny distal target to aim for, then it's really like hitting the bullseye and much more difficult. So the distal target is important. And we look at the distal cap for involvement of a bifurcation. There's a graphic. Here you can see a real example of actually a trifurcation at the distal cap. And what happens is if we get into a subintimal space and to grade, and we dissect past the distal cap, then we can dissect off one of the important branches. And, and, and that's, that's a concern. So the involvement of a bifurcation is a negative attribute for anti grade wiring if it's at the distal cap. So how do we resolve distal cap ambiguity? So the one method is to get retrograde and get subintimal. So here you could see in this case, it was unclear where the distal cap was, but if you get subintimal and knuckle past the distal cap, then you can resolve the ambiguity that way. And the alternative is to get subintimal and to grade. And here's a distal cap, which is highly ambiguous. There's this collateral channel, which connects somewhere beyond the distal cap. And it's not really clear what you need to aim for in this case. So if you get sub intimal and then knuckle past the cap and then get your cross boss distal here to your landing zone in the sub intimal space, you can then reconnect. So I will show you some more examples. In fact, using these particular cases in a short while. Then, we look at our landing zone, the, um, the, which is the zone beyond the distal cap. And this is particularly important for integrate dissection reentry. We need to see if it's big or small, healthy or diseased, or if it involves a bifurcation. So here's an example of a distal target in the right coronary and distal landing zone. The distal target is really tiny, and it's a tiny diseased distal landing zone. So it would be very difficult to wire this integrate because you'd be aiming for the bullseye and to do integrate dissection reentry ADR because you'd have a very small reentry zone. Contrast that with the image on the right, we've got a good distal target. So there's a long lesion that may not be suitable for integrate wiring, but if it was shorter, you'd have a nice target to aim for and a nice distal landing zone for reentry if you're going to do uh, ADR. In the occlusion itself, is the vessel course clear or ambiguous? So you really don't know if the vessel looks like this when you're trying to wire. And, it, and that is a dangerous situation. And if the lesion in the occlusion is long, more than 20 millimeters, there's much less chance of successful true-to-true -true wiring. We look for calcification in the occlusion because that acts as an obstruction and makes it difficult to perform true-to-true -true wiring. And tortuosity, as I've mentioned, is a, is a negative attribute within the occlusion. So let's look at this case of resolving ambiguity by tracking subintimally. Here is not a very long occlusion, nice tapered proximal cap, decent landing zone, although it's at a bifurcation, but not an important bifurcation. It's a marginal branch. And it looks feasible to wire this anti-grade, but the wire kept on entering a sub space and tracking into a completely ambiguous territory. So it turns out that this vessel had a sharp bend in it that was only resolved by creating a knuckle wire in the sub space, which clarified the ambiguity of the vessel course. If you've had a failed case before, you may want to consider CT scan to assess the vessel course, and that can help. But we don't do that generally routinely for every CTO because of cost. 
Right, interventional collaterals is the next thing that one needs to assess. And this is to determine if retrograde access is an option. We look at collateral channels in terms of their size. CC0 is an invisible channel. CC1 is a fine hair-like channel. And CC2 is a clear visible channel. And we determine the location. Is it septal, which is safer in case of complications? Epicardial channels are much more risky and they tend to be more tortuous. And if they rupture, they cause tamponade. Saphenous vein grafts can be a suitable channel as well. And then we look at the morphology. We look at their bends and if there's corkscrew and, there's, and, and the angle of entry and exit. So the optimal channel has a nine, more than 90 degree entry, which is easy to access. It has a nice CC2 clear channel with no tortuosity and a greater than 90 degree exit into the retrograde uh, connection. There's a 20% failure rate for retrograde access, and that's because of a lot of issues which I'll illuminate. Here's an example of a favorable channel. It's got a 90 degree access, not too bad. It's a nice clear channel without too much tortuosity, and it's got a greater than 90 degree exit, very suitable. Here's some other channel examples. These are epicardial channels, and although these are very tortuous, they're not, they don't have excessive bends and can be negotiated, indicated by the green tick. Even this one can be navigated. These can be navigated too. When they start having reverse bends and multiple reverse bends, that is when they become inaccessible. This is a channel in the septum, which is corkscrew like a telephone cord and not suitable, whereas these are nice and straight without too much corkscrew element and are accessible is a particularly large favorable channel. This epicardial channel is unfavorable. So this brings us to the J-channel score, which was published in your intervention this year in 2020. And the main elements of the score are the, are the collateral channel size, reverse bends, continuous bends, which is more than two bends, and corkscrew element, which is like a telephone cord. And the most important predictor was uh, vessel size. A small collateral channel is the hardest one to cross. Bends also add complexity and make it difficult. When you look at the actual CTO itself, then there's also the JCTO score, which assesses these things we're talking about. Tapered or blunt cap, calcification in the occlusion, tortuosity within the occlusion, long occlusion, or redo lesion. And anything more than Two, two or more is regarded as a very difficult procedure. The target vessel quality is not included in the JCTO score, and that's because in Japan, traditionally, ADR was not much used, but that is also equally important in assessment of the CTO. What we can so say is that if you've got a very low JCTO score, you've got a very high chance of getting anti-grade wiring and in a reasonable amount of time. So how do we decide what to do first with this information? So this is the hybrid algorithm, which is rather complex. And what I'm going to do is break it down into bite-sized chunks. So what we do is dual injection, and we assess the cap, the, the two caps, and the target, and our interventional collaterals. And what it basically means is if we've got a favorable cap, a good cap, anti-grade cap, and we've got a good target, then we're going to be for performing an anti-grade procedure. Good caps and good targets is anti-grade. Poor target and ambiguous caps is the best resolved through a retrograde approach. Plus for that, you need uh, retrograde collaterals, interventional collaterals. Then we assess the length of the vessel. So if it's more than 20 millimeters, whether it's anti-grade or retrograde, we're going to be performing dissection re-entry. So dissection re-entry is for long lesions and so the caps determine whether we go integrate or retrograde, and the length determines whether we go via dissection re-entry or via wiring. So how do we perform these steps? The guide wire is a very complex piece of engineering, and it's got many elements to it. It's got the wire, the core, the tip, and the coating, and it's got they've got multiple attributes. We've got tip load which is the, the, the defined as soft, medium, or hard, measuring grams, tapered or non-tapered, penetrating or non-penetrating, steerable, or a wire that finds its own path, 
and the tactile feedback can be good or poor, and it may be coated or jacketed. Now, the term hydrophilic, in my view, is incorrectly used in the United States. It's used to describe a jacketed wire, but in fact, a BMW is a hydrophilic coated wire. Hydrophilic can be a coating whether it's jacketed or not. So the black wires are actually plastic jacket or polymer jacket wires. The coating can also be hydrophobic or a hybrid coating, or there can be no coating. And what the coating does is it, it creates lubricity, which is a polymer coating with a hydrophilic coating. Those are the most lubricious, but they have the lowest amount of tactile feedback. You really don't get good feedback about what your wire is doing. Whereas with no coating, you get good feedback, but the trackability and lubricity of the wire is reduced. The tip load is measured in uh, grams from 0.3 grams to 20 grams or even more. And the tip load can be increased fivefold by having the micro catheter close to the tip of the wire. And penetration force increases with tip load and with tip taper. So how do you choose a wire? So this is a, a chart for Asahi wires, just one uh, guideline, a uh, guide wire company. And this is how the companies will present their wires to you. And uh, how are you supposed to choose a wire from these? Well, I don't think this is the way wires should be thought of or looking at all these individual attributes. What you need to know is that for a tapered cap, you want a soft, tapered, non-penetrating, jacketed wire that's lubricious, that will find its own path. And it doesn't have much feedback. You use it gently with liberal rotation, but no forward force. It finds its own way. An example of that is a Fielder XT or a Fighter Wire, and there are many others too. That's the cap I showed you, the favorable cap. When you've got an unfavorable cap or flat cap that you need a little bit more control, you want a medium, tapered, penetrating, non-jacketed wire so you can get feedback about what you're doing, steerable so you can control the wire, it doesn't find its own path, you have to direct it. You rotate this wire slowly and direct it with moderate force. An example of this is a Gaia wire. Then you've got the hard calcified cap. This, you need a hard wire, with a high tip load, tapered, penetrating, non-jacketed, so you can feel what you're doing, steerable, you rotate slowly, but you sometimes need to drill to get past uh, stubborn obstruction. And you may need considerable force. Once this wire's done its job, you may want to consider downgrading the tip load when the cap is crossed to a less penetrating wire. Example of these are Confianza, Hornet, and other wires. When there's tortuosity, you want a soft or medium wire, often jacketed so it can track very well, such as a pilot or fielder wire. Then you need to navigate the subintimal space. You need specific wires. To get subintimal, you may need a penetrative tapered wire. But once you've in subintimal, you change to a jacketed wire, such as a fielder or pilot, to track within the subintimal space with a knuckle formation. For reverse cart, when you're trying to reconnect your spaces, you need a steerable wire, which is controllable, such as a Gaia or Miracle. You may sometimes need a jacket if you've got resistance. For integrate dissection re-entry, you need to penetrate through your Stingray balloon, and that you need a really penetrate, penetrating controlled wire, such as a Hornet or a starter, which is a 20 gram wire. To cross collaterals, you need very flexible wires with low tip loads, such as Sion Sua 03, which is a, three gra a 0.3 gram tip, or feel the XTR if you need better trackability. This is the, mo the lowest tip load of the feel the XT family. For ex then there's special wires for exteriorization. So a few notes on wires. Become familiar with just a few wires. They'll be adequate for more than 90% of your cases. Limit the number of wires you are using. You don't need to know every wire that's out there. Use wires with vastly different properties. If you need to change from, if you've been using a field XT and you need to change, change to something like a Gaia wire, which is a significant change. Uh, going from Gaia 1 to Gaia 2 to Gaia 3 is really a waste of resources. If one strategy is not working, then switch strategy to something different. Wires can be dangerous, particularly slippery stiff wires with a combination of a microcatheter. Be vigilant for wire related complications, especially once you're across, don't miss your distal tip. 
And once a special specialty wire has achieved its mission, change to a safer wire. A word on microcatheters. So the role of the microcatheter is really to control your wire. Here's your microcatheter with your wire. If you don't have the microcatheter, you have very little wire control. And the microcatheter allows you to change wires halfway. If you threw the occlusion, you need to uh, change to a different wire. You don't have to start from the beginning. The, the standard uh, workhorse microcatheters are the Corsair Pro and the Turnpike uh, or Turnpike LP. We've got specialty catheters such as the Caravel, which is not a, uh, it doesn't have a coil on it, so it doesn't have what we call front wheel drive, but it is very flexible for, the, for collateral acts that are difficult. Angled microcatheters such as a Supercross for difficult access to side branches or to collateral channels and dual lumen catheters for accessing side branches once you've crossed the occlusion or to increase support when you've knuckled into a side branch and to get back into the true direction. To go into the great detail on these microcatheters, that I don't have enough time, that could be this entire subject on its own. Let's give you a few notes on integrated wire escalation, which is going to be the main first step that you'll be taking when you do a case. So this is ideal for short CTOs, with a favorable proximal cap. Always use a microcatheter. Use progressively more penetrative wires. If you enter the subintimal space, you've got three choices. Withdraw and redirect into the body of the occlusion. Use a parallel wire, so you keep your wire and even your microcatheter in the subintimal space and take a second system. Block that path and find an alternate path or change to an ADR or retrograde strategy. If you can't penetrate the proximal cap, there's some things you can do to help you. Have a, a, a good backup guiding catheter. You can use a guide catheter extension. An anchor balloon anchors your guide and gives you penetration force. Or you can anchor a microcatheter into the plug, which, uh, which allows you to um, penetrate. These are anchoring microcatheters. And then you can actually anchor the microcatheter with a balloon to prevent it backing out, or even wire through an inflated balloon. So this is that example that I showed you at the beginning where we've got a, a fine cross catheter in the epicardial collateral from the coldness branch to the proximal LAD. This is a nice trick because it saves contrast and gives you good imaging. That's an LAO. This is a spider view. You can see it's a short occlusion with a nice distal cap with a good distal target. This is a cranial view. You can see the distal target is good. And if you look very carefully, you can see this is suitable for integrated wiring because there's a tiny little channel over there, which I've highlighted in red in the right, and a tiny little channel in this view. So it is actually a tapered cap, and it's a very short occlusion with a good distal target. So this is perfect for integrated wiring. Here you start with a Turnpike LP, field XTA, to try and find that little channel on its own. And this wire starts making progress. You need to check your wire progress in multiple views, not just one view, because you can be misled as a 3D structure being visualized in 2D. So in all these views, it's looking pretty good. We're heading in the right direction. And now we get up to the distal cap. Is the Y in the true lumen? It looks like it in this view. It looks like it in the lateral view too. But the Y just didn't feel right. The Y must look and feel right. You can see when it advance a little bit further, it is actually in the subintimal space. And you can see wiring advancing further in the spider view. It's in the subintimal space. So you have two options now. You can uh, take a parallel system or redirect. Here with a Gaia second, which is a much more steerable, controllable wire, was able to redirect into the true lumen, as confirmed in the two views. And you can feel a big difference in the wire behavior when you're in the true lumen. Now, tip injection is something that you have to be careful of. You need to be sure that you've got a good reason to do it. This was really to define the distal anatomy and where to go. But you, if you're not sure you're in the true lumen, you should avoid a tip injection because you enlarge the subintimal space. Here's post-stent in this case, and you can see the distal vessel doesn't look great. 
So what do you do about this scenario with a distal vessel looking so small and tapered? Well, you should avoid the temptation to just balloon that whole area. With post intracoronary nitrate and post dilatation of the stent, you can see, in fact, this looks like a nice large vessel. These vessels have been underfilled for a long time and can look very small when they're successfully opened. ADR is ideal for long lesions with a good distal landing zone, a good distal vessel, without important side branches near the distal cap. You need a microcatheter, you need a trap liner, ideally, to be able to get your gear in and out, and you need a guide with no side holes, and you need to advance your trap liner into the into the vessel to have actually very low anti-grade pressures. You want damped pressures so that you don't enlarge your dissection once you've created it. Once you're into the subintimal space, never inject anti-grade. It's absolutely imperative. You should actually disconnect the syringe and advance the knuckle wire and extend the dissection to the landing zone with a cross boss, which is not imperative, but can be op an option if you don't have a tight knuckle. The cross bus tends to create a smaller dissection, as you can see in this image, compared to a wire. But if you've got a tight knuckle, you don't necessarily need the cross bus. And then you use a stingray to re-enter the true lumen. Um, and that is done, uh, has a specialty wire, which I don't like to use because of the barb, because it's unfavorable to the distal vessel. And I prefer to use a, a, a different wire, as I've mentioned earlier. If you're unable to re-enter the distal lumen, then you can change to a retrograde strategy. That would be your bailout strategy. If you can't get subintimal, what do you do? You need support that we've mentioned, good guide, guide extension, anchor balloon, the things I've already shown you. But there are other techniques such as a power knuckle, um, anchoring microcatheters. The power knuckle or base or grenadoplasty, what base is, is you inflate a balloon in the proximal vessel, proximal to the cap, create a dissection, and enter the dissection with a wire. Or grenadoplasty, you actually intentionally rupture a balloon to create a hydraulic dissection. Scratch and go, you use a, a stiff wire to get into the subintimal space and then go with a microcatheter and change to a knuckle. Or this balloon anchoring of the microcatheter, which is a power knuckle, and then you knuckle past, there's the balloon, there's the microcatheter and you knuckle past the balloon with into the subintimal space. You can also inject contrast through the microcatheter to create a hydraulic dissection. So here's a proximal cap looks good in this view and the distal cap looks favorable, but actually this is the case I showed you where the distal cap is actually highly ambiguous and the wire was not entering the true lumen here. So the way to resolve this was to get subintimal you can see the microcatheter is now subintimal past the distal cap. And then the cross boss is advanced to the distal landing zone, which is a good landing zone. You can see we're in the subintimal space, very close to the landing zone. And then you want to make sure that your stingray balloon is correctly orientated. Here you can see in the left that the stingray balloon has two wings. You should not see it like that. You should see the stingray balloon as a single line. This is not 100% perfect, but these were extremely using in this case. But you can see it's better. And you can see we need to aim down to get to the landing zone. So this is the Hornet 14 wire entering through the side of the stingray and getting into the true lumen. You can feel the wires in the true lumen. But you need to confirm that with a retrograde injection, confirming your position in the true lumen. And then you can exchange that out for a soft wire. And this is the final result after stenting. Retrograde wire escalation. Why would you bother with retrograde wire escalation? What is the point? This is ideal for short length lesions with an unfavorable proximal cap for anti-grade wire escalation. Often the proximal target is much bigger than the distal target. So it's like aiming for the dart, anywhere on the dartboard, as I mentioned. Always use a microcatheter, same principles as for anti-grade wire escalation. And once you're, you've crossed here, you enter the anti-grade guide and exteriorize. If you enter the subintimal space, then you can change to RDR technique. So here's a good case of why you would go with retrograde wire escalation. You've got a very ambiguous proximal cap with a large diagonal branch arising at the cap 
and you really cannot have any idea where to go. In addition, your distal cap is at a bifurcation with a large second diagonal at this distal cap, so you could potentially dissect this off with antegrade wiring. So this is a perfect case for retrograde wiring because you've got a nice big cap to aim for. Once you get retrograde, you can see you can clearly uh, aim for the retrograde for the for the cap at retrograde uh, with a retrograde wire easily cross and exteriorize and you don't compromise any of these side branches. So here you can see the two diagonals are widely patent after just a short stint. RDR is ideal for long length lesions with a poor quality distal vessel. You always use a microcatheter in both directions. Integrate and retrograde wires need to get into the subintimal space with knuckles. Never inject integrate until the stent is placed. Same principle, you don't want to uh, extend your integrate dissection. Balloon inflation on the, is performed on the integrate wire in the subintimal space, and that's the reverse card technique. Then you correct, connect your retrograde wire to the same space as your anterograde wire and then externalize. So this is the principle. You've got your retrograde wire and your anterograde wire. You create, you inflate a balloon on your anterograde wire to join these two spaces. So this is a different graphic. You can see the join the two spaces and you can put a guide catheter extension right into the occlusion. So you wire into the guide extension so you don't have to wire all the way back into the guiding catheter and risk dissecting at the aorta. And this is the principle of the guiding extension pickup. Here's your microcatheter in green, your integrate wire in blue, your retrograde wire in red. Your guide extension comes into the occlusion. You pull back your retrograde wire into the, the guide extension and exteriorize that way. Now, contemporary reverse cart is a slight modification. You prepare your integrate channel first for wiring. You try and wire in the straight part of the artery, not on a bend to maximize wire control. You try and wire virgin territory, so you don't start with a retrograde knuckle unless you have an ambiguous distal cap and you have to. Try and wire without a retrograde knuckle if you can. And try and wire towards the tip of the balloon, the integrate balloon, rather than from the side, you've got more chance of managing with a smaller integrate balloon. What if you can't connect your two spaces? So usually there's a point of relative wire proximity. I've shown you two spots here. And here's the in orange, the guide extension for assistance. And if you're not managing in the one spot, you can do the other spot and change what you call your base of operations to a better position. If the wires still remain far apart with a big hematoma, you can do what we call a straw maneuver. You can suck out the hematoma through the microcatheters, both integrate and retrograde and you can use a stiff retrograde wire. Um, so here I'm just going to show you this case with the highly ambiguous proximal cap, which was inaccessible, heavily calcified, uh, with a very poor distal target and a long occlusion. So this uh, was able to wire to the proximal cap into the side branch with the turnpike LP and field XTA. Fortunately, the microcatheter was able to cross for exchange for a rotoblader wire. And rotoblader was then performed in this proximal vessel to prepare for access to the proximal cap while the wire was in the side branch. Then afterwards, take the guide extension into the vessel and knuckle into the subintimal space uh, past the ambiguous proximal cap. Then extend that knuckle further distally. You can see this knuckle being extended and we've got a nice tight knuckle. Then we come retrograde. You'll notice I'm crossing the septal channel here with a C on wire, the uh, turnpike LP 150 microcatheter. We enter the distal vessel, and then we can do a tip injection to demonstrate our distal cap, which you can see is at a bifurcation, so it's not suitable for ADR. And it's an ambiguous distal cap, not really clear. Um, and you can notice that I've left the balloon up in the anterograde subintimal space, ready for reverse, ready for a reverse cart. And the reason for this is it creates stability and prepares the proximal vessel. Now, this was a ambiguous distal cap. You can see the knuckle backwards towards the proximal knuckle, towards the anterograde knuckle. 
and then advancing the microcatheter, knuckling further, and then the balloon is deflated and able to pull back the wire and wire into the guide extension, exteriorize, and then perform stenting. Now you do not inject ever antegrade, so your stent positioning has to be done with retrograde injection to check your position. So you don't inject antegrade until a stent is placed. You can see the guide extension right down the vessel to offer support. And then this is following uh, stenting. Just a quick word on complications. The main complication, don't be fooled into thinking you cannot create a myocardial infarction by uh, doing a CTO. You can lose collaterals and create myocardial infarction. And the two most common procedural complications are myocardial infarction and perforation. And perforation has an incidence of just over 5%. It leads to tamponade in 1% uh, of 20% uh, of perforations can cause mortality. And the risk factors for perforation are age, need for rotoblader, long lesions, ADR, or retrograde procedures. So be prepared. Make sure you have pericardial synthesis kits, covered stents, coils in your lab. If you don't have these in, in your lab, you cannot proceed with a, with a case. So a summary, just to summarize, safe CTO PCI is feasible with a high rate of success. Make sure you know where you're going. If you don't know where you're going, you could end up in a very unfavorable place. It's okay to stop. If you've spent a lot of time, used a lot of radiation and contrast, and you're worried about safety, come back another day with a more experienced operator and you can do it again. Thank you. Carol, <clears throat> you can put your video on. Um... There was one... Sorry, Azim, you broke up. Um, CTs, and also, you know, I really loved your description. Azim, I'm not hearing you, so I'm going to switch off my video again. Sorry, if you don't mind. Yeah, I'll switch. I'm going to switch mine off too. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I hear you. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I was saying I really enjoyed the presentation, particularly, you know, the description of the wire, the big five. Um, I think for the fellows, you know, to have this kind of basics, uh, also just for complex PCI is extremely important. So thank you very much. Um, I think it's so important really that we're going to ask you to do it again in the future uh, when we have a new set of fellows. So keep this presentation handy because we'd love to ask you to come back again and do it again. I just think there's some very important basics there. So I'm going to ask, pass it to Ahmed and ask Ahmed if he can uh, start moderating some of the questions and give you some questions, if that's okay. All right. Thank you, Dr. Latif. Uh, thank you, Dr. Halik, uh, for a great presentation. It was really informative. And uh, as Dr. Latif pointed out, it was really fellows directed. A lot of uh, information that, that is really to the point and very helpful for us. There are a few questions here, but I'm going to start with a couple of questions that I thought about uh, while listening to this uh, presentation. Um, in terms of access, uh, how often in your practice you use at least uh, one radial and how often do you use um, both radial for uh, CTO cases? Okay, well, I'm going to differ with what a lot of people do because um, you will know that many people are moving towards a dual radial access for CTO intervention. Um, I'm actually not a fan of radial access for CTO. Um, I think that the problem, you have multiple problems with radial access. One is, is the constant movement of the, of the catheters with respiration with a patient. And often you've got a lot of uh, instability of your guiding catheters, particularly when you've got proximal occlusions. And, um, and I think that you, backup is often compromised with radial access. So I'm actually a fan of dual femoral access to this day, even though I do use radial access for the for retrograde wiring in many cases. And for difficult procedures, I still favor uh, femoral access. 
I think um, with ultrasound guided femoral access, which we're doing now in the TAVI era or TAVI era, uh, femoral access has become a lot safer. And uh, I really think that you, uh, my personal opinion is femoral access is superior. Thank you. Um, there is a question from my co-fellow, uh, Miguel. He's asking about, you know, as a non-CTO operator, you know, most of us won't be a CTO operator, but if we encounter a CTO on a diagnostic cath, what is a good rule of thumb as to what information we should obtain for intervention planning? How can we be more helpful for the CTO operator that we're referring the patient to? What kind of projections, what kind of information we got to uh, get out of the um, angiogram. You kind of touch base on most of these things, but if you can summarize uh, again uh, for clarity. Yes, well, one of the difficult things is to, to you, we don't really advise getting second access for your diagnostic angiogram because of the, the added risk of, from the second access. We reserve that for the, for the procedure itself. But what I would say is make sure that you've got multiple projections, make sure your acquisitions are long enough. Don't do these very brief acquisitions. Get long acquisitions where you can give time for collaterals to fill the vessel and look carefully at multiple projections and make sure. And then you can do your zoomed out views. Once you've found the optimal projection, do long runs where you can assess your collaterals uh, with clarity. And then for the procedure, if you start with dual access and repeat those projections that were from your diagnostic angiogram and then get further information from your dual injection before you start the CTO. But most of the time you can plan the CTO without dual injection on your diagnostic angiogram. I think you want to use adequate contrast to get all this information and therefore it's not ideal to proceed straight to the CTO immediately. It's better to reschedule, make sure you have time to look at the angiogram properly and then save all your contrast for the procedure on a different day. Great. Uh, Dr. Menegas is asking, what techniques do you use for uh, uh, exteriorizing the retrograde wire and what problems do you encounter? Okay, so if you've got a great deal of tortuosity, you may find a lot of rigidity and difficulty exteriorizing. Um, make sure your catheters are well flushed uh, without contrast. Once your microcatheter is, is out, is into the retrograde guide, you can remove your wire, make sure you flush your systems well to lubricate everything and, uh, and clean your wires nicely and advance them through to the other side. Sometimes I've even used a rotoblader wire when it's very difficult to advance because it's got a lower, it's a 008 wire, it's even smaller. So it copes better with extreme tortuosity. And when you get to the opposite um, access site, you put your introducer into your TUI, disconnect, put your wire into your introducer and advance the wire through the introducer. I actually have videos on that, which I didn't show because in the interest of time, but I can um, perhaps add it to my talk next time. Yep. Um, one more question from Aisha, which is a question that comes to the mind of every interventional fellow, I guess. Um, She's asking, would you say CTO is a niche specialty? And how important would you say uh, is a dedicated CTO training or proctorship for starters? Look, I think everybody is going to be able to do some CTOs, all interventionalists. I think what I want to do highlight is that if you assess your angiogram very thoroughly and you plan very carefully and you know exactly how to assess your CTO, then you have a chance of choosing which ones are the appropriate ones. So that one I showed you that anti-grade wiring is a good one for any qualified interventionist with some experience to try. Of course, you can stop if you're not winning and come back. The very difficult CTOs which require dissection re-entry techniques, I think are, is a specialist area that does require dedicated CTO uh, operator, I think you need a lot of numbers to be good at that kind of procedure. Personally, I do over 100 retrograde procedures a year. So I think you need um, you need those kind of numbers to get into the high 90s with your, with your success rate. But uh, it doesn't mean that 
it's all or nothing. There's many CTOs that can be done by interventions who are not dedicated CTO operators. The most important thing is to assess your CTO properly. Yeah. So it would be fair to say, you know, as a CTO uh, beginner, you know, out of uh, intervention of fellowship, if you encounter a case where you think, you know, it's kind of like a GCTO one or two, you could try the integrate uh, escalation technique. And if you're not successful, you just stop and refer to someone who has way more experience with CTO. Correct. Uh, so to follow up on this question, um, Ray is, Dr. Ray is asking um, about your experience for CTO PCI uh, in terms of the wire you choose first. Uh, so commonly we start from workhorse wire and then how you actually take it from there. If you can walk us through your uh, wire escalation technique. Okay, so the term workhorse wire is actually not a term I like because each wire's got its own role. So I don't think work, there's such a thing as a workhorse wire. Even workhorse wires, so-called, have to be chosen for specific needs in this, any case. Um, but um, what you're referring to, I think, by workhorse wire is really just to deliver your microcatheter to the cap. It has no other function. In CTO, you need a specialty wire for every single thing you do. So I've tried to explain that um, the, the prefavorable cap, you use a jacketed tapered soft wire. For an unfavorable cap, you would use a steerable tapered wire, such as a Gaia. For a difficult cap, you'd use a tapered uh, high tip load, 9, 12, 14 gram, 20 gram wire for penetration. Um, I think that the workhorse wire is never the first wire for a CTO. Don't even try with a workhorse wire because all you're going to do is create complications and reduce your chance of success. So like you go uh, on with the microcatheter on one of those specialty wires, like you start with the fighter or you, you, you take the uh, microcatheter on a workhorse no, wire. You, del you deliver the microcatheter to the cap with your workhorse wire, but that's right. the only role of the workhorse wire. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Um, another question um, about which uh, kind of like uh, finding that favor Retrograde, retrograde strategy in the presence of significant disease in the donor vessel, um, i.e. lifeline vessel, how would you approach that in such a situation? So I'm not sure I understand the question properly. Um, so you, you've got a, a lot of disease in the proximal vessel. That's an important vessel. So well, no, really, if you're, you know, the vessel giving your collaterals has a lot of disease. Oh, right, okay? right, 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 right. And right. now you have to use it as your retrograde vessel. I mean, right. any considerations, hemodynamic support, for example. Right, right. Okay. So uh, if you're going to be creating ischemia with your microcatheter across a lesion, such as you're doing a right and there's a proximal LAD stenosis and you're creating ischemia with your microcatheter across that stenosis, you may want to treat that stenosis first. What I would say is don't stent that stenosis first un unless you have to, because it may compromise your access to your septal channels. You, you dilate it and stent it at the end of the procedure once you've, unless it doesn't interfere with your retrograde access to access the septal channels. If you've got a very important channel that's gonna create a lot of ischemia, you may want to choose a smaller channel. If you have no choice and you have to use a very important channel that's going to create ischemia, then you have to manage the patient as a whole and weigh up the risk of the procedure versus the potential benefit. And you may need to need use hemodynamic support in these kind of situations, particularly if there's left ventricular dysfunction. Thank yeah. you. Uh, there was also a question about AFR, so integrate fenestration reentry. Um, I'm not sure if it's a technique you use, or maybe you can describe what it is and tell us whether you use it or not. Well, I use it as a last resort. Um, maybe if you just I, tell everybody what, what AFR is, because I'm not sure most people know what AFR is. Yeah, so it's not a technique I use much. Um, um, so I 
maybe you can uh, give some more information on that. Uh, yeah, so AFR uh, is a technique, I, I think probably Mauro Carlino uh, from Milano is the one of the people who has proposed it. So basically when, instead of doing a reverse cut <clears throat> to connect to the, uh, true lum the two true lumens, if you now find yourself doing an ADR, so you're in your, in your false lumen integrally, uh, what Mara is saying is that uh, you inflate a balloon uh, in, the, um, in the false lumen and really as the balloon's deflating, you then try and wire the true lumen, okay? Um, so you do it, you're trying to fenestrate integrally uh, and re-enter. Now, not everybody likes the technique because there's concern that you're making the false lumen larger. And so, you know, you may be creating more of a hematoma and so you could actually compress the true lumen. Um, so, but there, there, there is some literature, there's, there's a paper published in CCI, if anybody wants to read about it. I'm not sure that, you know, that majority of the CTO operators are using it. I think it's a small minority. You, I don't know what your experience has been, um, Farrell. Yeah, look, it's not really clear how much that differs from uh, from reverse cut because you're not always sure which lumen you're in. In fact, in, uh, you know, sometimes you're clearly in this false lumen, sometimes or sub internal space. Sometimes you're in and out, in and out. So it's not, um, but. If the principle is to always wire towards the tip of the balloon anyway. Even if you're doing a reverse cot, you want to try and wire towards the tip of the, the distal tip of the balloon rather than from the side, because it does give you the best chance of re-entry. Yeah. yeah. You know, the problem with AFR is you only integrate here, so you're not actually retrograde. Um, and so you're trying to fenestrate by ballooning inside the inside the um, retrograde, I'm sorry, inside the f false lumen, I, like I say, you could, all, all you may do is end up extending the yeah. false lumen and make it more challenging. So not, that's part of the reason why not everybody is so keen about AFR, but maybe yeah. we'll move on to some of the yeah. other questions. Um, one question from my co-fellow, Michael, he's asking about, uh, you, you kind of uh, touch base on the role of CT and geography for planning purposes. And uh, one role is to kind of like uh, resolve the ambiguity of the proximal cap or the uh, proximal tract of the uh, CTO. Can you elaborate more how, you, how other scenarios can be actually uh, useful for using uh, CT and geography for planning purposes? So CTO and geography very seldom for failed cases, redo cases, I think CDO uh, can, uh, CT can be helpful because it helps you identify where you went wrong potentially if you struggled with a vessel course. The other thing is where it may be helpful is in patients with previous bypass grafting, uh, where you may have some distortion of the anatomy from the graft, and that can help you uh, anticipate this challenge. So often you get a kinking of the native vessel at the anastomosis site. So I think this is a, th th this is an area where, where you may choose to do CT. And in fact, in bypass graft patients, where I'm not clear from the injections in the grafts, what exactly is going on with the anastomotic site, I sometimes do CT. Thank you. Uh, there are a few uh, other questions. I don't know if uh, Dr. Latib, do you think we can answer a couple more in terms of- Yeah, I think maybe let's just do the last two questions and then we'll stop there. So the, the one from Shun and then the other one from YDX. Yeah, uh, Shun is asking about any technique or specific wire to keep the knuckles small and tight and also what size balloon should we choose for reverse cart? Okay, so the the knuckle um, to keep to some extent this is not entirely in your control the size of the knuckle, um, but what I would say is watch your knuckle very closely because you will see the knuckle begin to expand as you enlarge in the lumen. If you go more distal and your knuckle's getting bigger, rather stop and come from your other direction. So your integrated knuckle is that if it starts off small and is enlarging rapidly, stop, come retrograde and rather resolve that issue. 
don't keep on pushing an enlarging knuckle forward because then it'll get bigger and bigger and bigger. And um, if, you, if you're not happy with the way your knuckle's going, don't advance it. You can always try and knuckle in a slightly different direction uh, and find the best plane for your knuckle. But to, sometimes you cannot control, you can get your wire wrapping around the vessel due to calcification and you may not be able to control that at all. Um, the balloon for reverse cart uh, ideally should be a small balloon. You start with the smallest balloon, like 2.5. And if you're not winning, you increase your balloon. Because uh, with contemporary reverse cart, if you're able to do end balloon wiring, then a small balloon is sufficient. A larger balloon may be necessary if you've got a very large subintimal space. So you have to tailor that, but try and start with a smaller balloon. Thank you. Uh, one last question uh, about your strategy for osteo flush CTO. Um, how do you approach it? Is retrograde always your preferred strategy in such a case? Well, if you're able to engage the guide a little bit into the osteum, you can get some anterograde knuckle going. But if you've got a true osteal occlusion where you cannot even engage a guide, then retrograde is really your only option. But what you've got to get, be careful of there is not to dissect the aorta, because as you come back um, retrograde and you're in the subintimal space and you don't find the osteum, then you can actually send your knuckle right up the aorta and create an aortic dissection. So it's a potentially dangerous situation. And you may need then a stiff wire to actually penetrate into the aorta and create a neo-osteum. But this is very advanced stuff. And I think uh, for highly experienced operators. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think uh, that may be a great place to stop. Um, Farrell, uh, firstly to the participants, thank you for a great questions and discussion. Farrell, that was fantastic. I'm sorry we had some audio issues, but uh, your slides were you know, amongst the clearest and slides I've ever seen for, for fellows and you know, trying to explain these concepts on CTOs, uh, on how to use wires, microcatheters, you know, and I think also we don't, maybe it's our fault as teachers, we don't spend enough time maybe teaching really how to interpret the angiogram and look at the angiogram in details because CTOs really, if you want to be a good CTO operator, you really need to spend a lot of time analyzing the angiogram in detail uh, to plan your strategy. Um, and I'm certainly been stimulated by your talk to spend more time with my fellows, showing them how we do that. Um, I can't thank you enough. We are gonna ask you to come back and do this again because this was really good. And um, as always, I appreciate your support, Phil. Stay well, stay healthy and take care of yourself. Thanks, Azim. Normally our connection here is perfect. And uh, I don't know what happened today. I've had so many Zoom calls from this location without any hassles. And uh, it's really uh, unfortunate. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure what happened today. <laughs> Ahmed, thanks for great moderation. Uh, thank, thank you. you. Enjoy thank the you rest so of your day. Great presentation. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Be well. Thanks, Farrell. Okay, bye-bye.